So very happy to be here because I also, it's quite a while ago, but I very vividly remember this uh, decision that I had to make when I figured out that there were a lot of people that are smarter than me and better at publishing. You know, they're smarter at me. I shouldn't have said that, but they were better at publishing and that my chances of getting a professorship are, you know, maybe average and that there are very few professorships. So it's a tough one. And I will get to that in a second. Okay. But the long story short is that uh, in the end, it turned out to be something very uh, positive for me. But the other end was, I wanted to be a professor. That was my goal. That's what I, why I studied psychology, and that's why I did a PhD. And you could refer to me as a failed academic. I really tried. Um, and then I ended up in industry. I, I said I ended up, but I have to say, now being in industry for a while, I found that a lot more people actually wanted to go to industry. And both transitions were fine. Okay, that that's basically, I think, to my background and the motivation. And since then, I have done that many times that I gave for OHBM or so. I gave always this talk, hey, what to do and what to think about if you want to transition from academia to industry. And the talk has changed over time. And this time, I found it has changed the most. Why? I asked ChatGPT to avoid saying you stuff that you can learn um, without, you know, hour of so many people. It's a value, your valuable time. So what can I tell you what you couldn't get told by chat GPT? And I was very surprised. Basically, my whole talk, GPT knows. And it gave all the insights and all the steps. So I took whatever GPT is recommending. And I said, what is there that I could tell you more? So I would nearly say I will be quick on a couple of places, and I highly encourage you to have a quick chat with the AI of your choice and use all the tools you can get out there. And I will only go to those three little places that I found that the GPT is not pointing you to or not telling you as much. Okay. Yeah, okay, wonderful. Then. So I transitioned after five years of studying psychology and then three years of PhD. I studied, um, I did my PhD on combining EEG and fMRI and on emotion and attention. And I switched to brain products, uh, a leading manufacturer of research EEG systems. I was first in scientific support and then I was more on the management side. I built a company in the U.S. That's this uh, brain vision company. And then founded another company in Canada, Brain Vision Solutions. And then I transitioned to uh, Nyrex. This is a Berlin-based manufacturer of FNES equipment, so measuring brain activity with infrared light. And to you, basically, the only interesting part is why did I switch to brain products? Well, I was using their equipment and their software for eight years. Their support was free. I was asking tons of questions and wrote very bad analysis scripts and always relied on their support to fix my science. Um, and I think at one point, okay, that's a joke. But at one point, it was cheaper to hire me than to hire somebody else helping me all the time. Now, I had a very good relationship with them. And I wanted to stay close to science and not forget all that stuff that I've learned over the last eight years. So I was very happy to be hired as a scientific consultant. But, you know, after one year, I went more on the business side. Anyway, with Nyrex, I'm currently in Berlin since four years. And we are a 50-people company. And a lot of our team, um, I counted that yesterday, and I came up with 20 people in our company of basically directly out of university uh, with some sort of a science background and joined us. So one path to industry. Anyways, the reason why we are talking or why it's good we are talking is that, yes, at one point we figure out that there are more PhDs uh, than there are tenure-tracked professorships, right? 
So this is a graph from Steve Flock where he said if everyone that does a PhD would end up in a professorship, that's how the numbers would look like. And you see, yes, it grows exponential because every three years, two or three more uh, professors would obviously not work if you have a 50 year uh, or let's say 30 year work track. So it is just a fact that a lot of us will have to transition to industry. And the sooner we face that, the or realize that the better we are off, the more we can steer towards where we want to go, which I think one of the biggest challenges is to know very well where you want to go. The earlier you know, the better you are off. So the question is, um, how do you figure out where you want to go? And one thing that helped me was to have skills a skill set that the company wanted but that was easy for me because i wanted to be with a company that was in the research field if yeah no i should stop here nearly and encourage you you know there's no way you are going if you don't know where you're going you will not figure out how to get there so what i'm saying here is you need to sit down with whatever tool, whatever friends you have and figure out what you like to do and what you don't like to do. And it's kind of, I, it's not my domain of expertise and I, you know, should, there should be somebody giving a talk that's, I don't know, a personality coach or whatever, or a life coach. Um, I find that it is very hard to figure out what you really want to do. And you have to figure out those factors to want to, impact work-life balance how important is it to make a lot of money and once uh, how risk uh, adverse or not am i so before i go in this what i'm doing here in the specifics when you know where you want to go and you can analyze jobs i think it's even more important to first know about yourself and i've found that the people that are really determined, I want to do that and plan that strategically. By the way, professorship positions, this is, from my perspective, the biggest predictor. The people that early on do a strategic um, plan on how they want to end up in a professorship, they have the highest likelihood to get that. And the scary part is if you commit to such a project, and not so, oh, I maybe get a professorship, maybe I don't, then you have to accept that you do something with all your will and you may fail. And that's a scary thing. So a lot of people say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm drifting. And maybe it happened. Maybe it doesn't. And some people pretend that they don't care, but they have this precise plan. And this precise plan makes all the difference. So long story short here, before I come to this um, next page, I would say is, of course, you have to have a good understanding where you want to go. This helps you with everything later on. Okay. Assume you have figured out what your dream job looks like in terms of work-life balance, mobility. You want to work in, you would accept to work abroad. You want to work abroad, all those factors. Then you can start to look at how do I get there and what do I have to offer that gets me to a position and then which positions do exist that I would fit to. Okay. And here I would then be at this point where I'm now basically this slide. If you have figured out what you like to do and what skills you bring for what you like to do, then you can translate your skills over, right? As a PhD, I assume most of you are something like psychology, neuroscience, um, computational neuroscience. Yes. Okay. There, there, there are some other domains where the people basically study something which they think are specific skills. You study engineering, you have learned to design something, and you think what I studied is exactly what I bring to the market. If you have studied neuroscience, you feel like I'm learned a lot very smart but uh this is nothing that the company writes in their resume uh, or in their sorry in their job ad and you feel like nothing i've learned is actually matching what they are looking out there and this is not true 
It's just a translation thing. Um, this is why I say the first thing you should do is before you read all those job ads and figure out that you have none of that, you should sit down and think, what did I do in terms of non-scientific, you know, transfer, uh, translated, like with a dictionary, data analysis, project management, problem solving, and so on. Yeah, This is things that you for sure have done, and you should just look uh, at those job, you know, the job description and at what you have done and make sure that you are self, that you know that you learned all of that. And by the way, it's one of the things that actually if you have fought through a PhD, three years of self-motivated or five years of highly self-motivated work, and then you read the job ads, they are looking for a self-starter and team player. You can't be much, you can't be more of a self-starter than somebody who managed to pull off that five years. Uh, sorry, nothing against PIs, but PIs are not very encouraging bosses. They let you work for months at a time, sometimes all by yourself. So this is. Think about what you did. And actually, very likely, you did something um, pretty amazing. And you just have to translate that over so you know that, hey, I have done all of this. I have those skills. And write them in your resume. OK. The second part is, at the moment, uh, there are some skills that we are learning, hard skills, like the engineer, that are actually thought uh, highly sought after in the industry. Um, your data analysis, yeah, if you think I have done some, I think most people nowadays have touched machine learning in the one or the other way to analyze your data. So, and, and at the moment, when I look at what the people are hiring and this uh, being able to say, hey, I, I did big data and whatnot is such a skill that is taught in basically every industry. So we do have learned something, measuring humans, and systematically, scientifically, really being able to measure humans and to analyze data and find such things in data, you actually have a very technical skill. Most of you for sure have a technical skill that is highly in demand. Uh, again, it's a translation thing. So we do have technical skills, but also those need to be translated. Okay, last point on this slide here is just, it's hard to see what jobs exist and how they actually look like and to be in touch with people that are in the, in this other realm if you don't expose yourself to the realm. Yes, there is a crossover. You go to a conference and you meet some people that, like me, on the other side of the booth and trying to sell you something, but this is just one little job. And there's a lot of things that you would never see if you... Um, not go there and have somebody in your friend group that does it. So I can highly encourage you to figure that out. Once you know where you're going, you can figure out the landscape there. You can go to a conference um, of basically every every type of um, every domain has their own uh, conferences. And you can go to such a conference and, and network there. A, you find out what they're doing, how they do it. B, you make the connections. And we will later on get to where do I find jobs. I think I should go there now. It's, in my opinion, the best way to um, have a shortcut in getting hired. Up to your PhD, your value grows on without being specific. So you have done a bachelor, master is more, PhD is more. There is some industry where they would already say your PhD is too special, particularly if you don't translate for them and says, no, during my PhD, I learned something that is like three years in industry. Three years in industry, I would have learned X. Three years of PhD, I learned Y, some, something else. So I think to that point, you are, the PhD could already be depending on what the position is. Um, beyond that, you become an expert in a narrow, in, in smaller and smaller field. And if that is what the company is looking for, you get paid. Let's say you made 20 years in machine learning and AI. Now you would be looked for those 20 years would be counted as highly valuable uh, job experience, like being in, in uh, 
Boston Consulting versus in the Berlin um, Machine Learning Group, an AI group, 20 years there or 20 years there is counted the same thing and would be highly paid for. If you did 20 years of research on emotion attention and then you go or, or fMRI and EEG and you go to an insurance company that would pay you basically this PhD level in the next 20 years would not be paid for. So being too late, yeah, there are some HR people that would sort somebody out that has 20 years of the wrong or 10 years of the wrong experience because they assume that you should get paid for your experience and you are bringing your experience to the wrong place. So the longer you are a postdoc, the more valuable you are for a, more, a smaller and smaller market. Like having 20 years of experience in one very particular job, and then in that job you get paid. And if you hire, if you apply somewhere else, they yeah, cool, 10 years, but not paying for it. Again, I fully agree. The longer, the longer you do something, this can be either making you more and more valuable if it's a match, or it makes you less and less valuable. And no, no, it makes you the same value. But if if it's not a fit, as a future employer, you are afraid that this person actually would be more valuable somewhere else, and you are a second choice, a compromise, whatever, you would have to really convince them. And it's a cut in salary. So basically, if you just, you are the value that you're bringing is your PhD, basically. And losing 10 years of value is very, very painful in your career path. That's why you don't want to do it. So, okay. Then... Thank you very much. Um, this is something, this slide, I left it in there and I will just be super quick about it because I found, again, again GPT, if you ask, hey, this is what I want to do, this is uh, this is my profile, that's what I'm interested in, where would I find jobs? It actually did a better job than I did. Um, so, <laughs> uh, I highly encourage that again, but I would Quickly, yeah, uh, if you are looking for a job where your scientific background, particularly this postdoc question, is likely to be a match and being paid for, then there, there's some places like ResearchGate. I gave this talk at OHBM, so that's why I'm saying the OHBM board. There are some places where jobs, where, where people are looking for scientists, where they would go. Anyways, company websites. But then you would be in a very specific industry. Uh, LinkedIn is at the moment, I find, getting more and more of an active recruiting tool. So if you put your, uh, if you have your, anyone, <clears throat> any application that will check out your LinkedIn profile, this is uh, LinkedIn is basically making the, all, all their money with being a recruiting tool. And there is no recruiter that is not having some level of LinkedIn membership. You can pay one person license, you can pay $20,000 for a, a recruiter license of LinkedIn. So this is a very powerful tool and it's used by all. So you should have your LinkedIn profile um, matching what you want to do. Uh, you, you know, your job where you want. Who, who shall find me? This is the question. And this is how you should update your LinkedIn profile. I had in initiative applications earlier found that a good idea. I have to say it is less and less of uh, worth the effort to write somewhere where they are not having, you know, where it's not a specific match, but you could do it. Yeah, and I gave this talk at the OHBM 2019. And what I wanted to say, if you are in a conference that has your scientific background and you talk to Whoever is there from a company, they obviously have an overlap. So it was my way of saying um, you are in a good place to find some industry jobs in such a, such an event talking to the industry. So whatever conferences you are going to. Okay. One insight that I found that um, wasn't on ChatGPT is that if you read a job ad, and if some of you have done that already, it feels like everyone is looking for the same thing. You read over and over again those stupid things of uh, self-starter and team player and, right? It's really like, are there not any creativity on their side? Um, 
there are some there were some studies, some big studies made uh, a lot of them in the US, so I don't know if they're hundred percent transferable, where they tried out everything from when do you post a job ad, how much reactions do you get? And what how how many words can you put? Well, it, there's a curve. It's too short versus it's too long. Actually, too long is the worst. So there was a lot of money spent hiring highly talented and sorry, no, not sorry. You shall know you are the highly talented people that companies are fighting for to hire. And let me say it even differently. It's not, there is never a shortage of people. They are trying to find people that are matching very well the position and want to work there because those people are willing to do the job for less money. Absolutely clearly, we should be aware of it. This, oh, there's a job shortage. And we have, all this effort is done by the company to get somebody that is willing to do the job for somewhat less. We should also address the point of, hey, what salary shall I ask for? A little bit later. I'm so sorry. These slides are jumping by themselves. I have no idea why, but let's not be distracted. I will jump. Sometimes they will jump forwards. I will jump backwards. Okay. Company side of the job is the following. They spend a lot of money on figuring out where to post, when to post. Average hiring campaign, you spend something like three, four, five thousand dollars on just placing the ad on LinkedIn and all those stepstone and whatnot platforms. Um, and you have a recruiter working for you that costs you also money. If you are hired via a recruiter, it's usually one fourth or one third of an annual salary that this recruiter gets paid. So it's an expensive thing. And the job ad is the best thing they can come up with because they do think that they want to have a team player and they do think that they need somebody for this position as a self-starter. And sometimes, yes, they copy the same thing over and over again. But some at one point, somebody thought, yeah, this is really what we need. So while those job ads read very uncreative and boring, actually the creative one gets less applications. So this is why we are having those very standard job ads. It is the best the company came up with. And if you have that in mind, then you write your application like the person actually mean it. Even so, everyone writes that they actually meant to write that. And you should respond to it like they really want that. And yeah, so that company side of the job ad. Um, and this is where I get to the cover letter or your CV. If you write a cover letter and I should do this differently. Yeah, I'll do the second slide. Sorry for flipping it around, but I think this is um, the best way that I found, not ChatGDP, but that is the thing ChatGDP didn't tell you, but this is specific for you. You are very good in asking for money for yourself. It's called writing a grant. A grant is I have my specific work that I have done. I translate that to a specific opportunity, the grant call. And here's what I did. And that is what you want to hear in the grant. And this is why it matches. And then you get paid for two years or so. You get money to be paid for two years. If you approach a job the same way you approach a grant call, you are actually in an extremely good shape to win that. You win 5%, 10% out of your grants, right? Which is one in 10. If you just write random application, like, oh, I'm quickly writing them and sending them. I've met people that said, I wrote 300 applications. I heard back from four. If somebody would tell you that they have written 300 grant application in three months, you wouldn't expect them to win four. You would expect them to win none. So if you write applications like, yeah, I exchanged the name of the company and sent that out, and then the next, the next, the next, you are going for things with a very low fit. So here's my personal recommendation. Think of applications like of grant applications. Find opportunities that really match your interest and background. You would do that for a grant. You wouldn't apply to some engineering grant, right? Tailor your story to translate what you have done really to fit that. 
And by the way, with the grant agency, I would call the DFG and would say, hey, DFG, I want to apply for grant I, X, Y, and Z. Do you have any tips? Can you get, tell me on the rules? Is there anyone that helps me? By the way, who is writing grants, you will be surprised that some people actually talk to the grants officers and those grant officers are actually very happy to help you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I figured that out way too late. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that is a uh, most, most important approach to look at it like you would look at a grant. Okay, and now I'm basically I'm one uh, slide back. This is now, if you have now found this grant and you would write your whatever motivation letter, you would make it very specific. I think this makes you stand out. I'm seeing, I would say something like 300 to 500 applications a year for various, and I would say 200 of them is in for scientific positions. The cover letters that are really meant to be specific about the company are standing out. There's one in 20. I know that those things now, LinkedIn and so on, makes it super easy where you just click and say, I want to apply. But this is this is 80. You know, for a typical position, you get something like 50 applications. And the applications that have zero specificity, you would have to get really lucky. If you, and, and, and to be honest, usually on your side, wasn't a good match for you either you just said i i click if it's a good match and you really want to think that it want to get their attention i do think it makes a difference to a address the job ad as much as you find it generic to address it line by line like you would do for a grant and to address the company and make this little translation. Hey, I think, you know, you're looking for this and I have done really that. You look for a team player. I have worked in a team of 15 people or with three, uh, three students, TVs and blah, blah, blah. You're looking for somebody who is a self starter. In my PhD, I had only once every three months supervision and I did all the project on time, on budget, whatever myself, all self motivated. You are looking for, I have done that. Here's an example. So this translation of your skills, because they can't translate your skills. You are, sorry to say it, you're smarter than them. You know that statistics means I am able to measure humans and understand numbers. You have to translate it for them. Okay. So then I said, yes, the best way of doing it, think of an application as a grant. Okay. Very good question. Because in a grant, they tell you exactly which font to use and how many letters and you know, how long it can be and how many pages. So in a grant, you have this external framework that guides you. In an application, you don't have that. Um, generally speaking, if you have some, you know, you have this HR person getting 50 application or, or so. So if you write three pages, it's not going to help you. If you structure an application, like, again, like a scientific paper, you write what you want, what you're going to write, then you write it, then you write what you have written. Basically, you structure it. Um, you have your three key points or so. So you start off whatever, if it's your cover letter, Typically, a cover letter, the people take the first sentence or the first two sentences and they adjust this one. And then they have a generic thing that they send to everyone. And then they have the last paragraph where they write. And hence, I really think I would work in your in your um, lab. And you say, sorry, you should have fixed your sentence, should have written company. So if you just go up there and say... Um, let's say there are three, four points or mission statements or something like that. You go to a company and says, your mission statement of the company is X. I identify really with this because I have worked on Y in my research. And then you take the three points, what you, the job ad, where, where you think this is what the job ad focuses on and says, particular because you are looking for a person doing X, Y, and Z, and I have done what? Z, Y, and X here. And you link those two things together. You give... Sorry, this is human sales pitch, right? Um, do you try to get with your abstract? You will going to tell them that you make this connection and then you make some of the connections. If their job ad is three pages long, I wouldn't go that long. Nobody is reading that. But I would make sure that you end up with something like, 
page or less where and, and again a little bit industry if you write to a startup uh fast blah, 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 they are happy if you can express yourself very condensed and you want to make it appealing and nice basically if you write to a siemens where you have a hr person that has a process and needs to read every application and give it some rating and a fixed scale and so on this person will read more so i'm not sure i'm i'm feeling like saying i'm i'm guessing here it's not within my core expertise maybe chat gpt no yeah but hmm, find a compromise Okay, um, thank you very much. <laughs> you point to something that I have kind of forgotten up there. Um, I'm running a fairly ethical company, and it's it's here. I I have my philosophy brochure on the table, and you can see it's pretty worn because I'm basically grabbing it every day. Um, but even I, once in a while, reach that point that I try to attract smart people to a boring job. Yeah. So being a little bit wake, there is a problem. We do need uh, in industry really smart people sometimes to do a job, and this job has. Sorry, if I if how many how many people here really would like to go and sales cold call sales? I I'm not seeing any hands, right? But there is there is quite a demand for selling all kinds of equipment. Sales makes the, you know, that's one very essential part of the machine. So when they have to sell a sales job, they are not they're not too keen on writing that they are selling a sales job, but they look then for a um customer success. Uh, associate or something like that and that travels and speaks to clients and yeah sorry go out there tell them what it costs and sell here's your commission and so on and so forth you get jobs that are less glorious no let me put it this way um and we will get that point in in a moment an interview goes both ways you want to interview with this company and the company should interview with you uh, and some of the positions and we try to attract smart people and you have lots of options so we try to stand out so we are selling in a job ad as as good as we can and if the job is not that glorious they will if the job doesn't make sense and it reads weird if it smells weird it is weird it's usually something that would be less attractive we try to write this position to be attractive and we spent quite some time on, oh, what should we put first? And should we put this or that? And I said, the point, shall we put the salary or not? That's a long discussion in a company. And then you can just figure out what we said before. Make your connections on LinkedIn. Find people that work there and just contact them on LinkedIn. Hey, I saw the job ad. I see you do something similar. Would you like to connect? I would be really grateful if you could spend 30 minutes of your time. And you will be surprised. In many cases, you will find somebody who is really happy to talk to you. Particularly, you're, you're a scientist. You have something very interesting to offer, your background and your story. And obviously, people are very interested to in getting smart and interesting colleagues. So you have good chances of, um, if you really want to know what a job is, you can talk to somebody in that company. But I hope that answers the question that sometimes the jobs are trying to sell something. Good. Okay. Then another thing that I found was not put that clearly in um, GPT when I asked it, but you know they said you should have somebody double check your work, uh, your your application data. Damn, I really am embarrassed to say that to PhD level people. You know, I feel like I shouldn't say that to anyone that graduated high school but 50 percent of my of the applications i'm getting are badly written off formatting error different pages in there uh address the wrong person names of company and and person address misspelled um it does matter so if you apply to a job as a data analyst or as a software programmer they may don't care 
okay, this person doesn't ever have to communicate with somebody. If you have a job where you communicate, where communication is part of your job or writing any reports or something like that, it will matter what you produce. So I say here, use Grammarly or any Jack GPT, please check my text. Use simple, this is for an application to a German company. Please use simple English. Make a very good chat GPT prompt. You can, by the way, ask chat GTP, please improve my chat GPT prompt and it will do so. So get a real good prompt, check your work and make sure it's really correctly written. You can even sell this an application to this company. Please make sure that I address them correctly. Little things. German application, you want to put in a picture. It's just how Germans are. I think it's, you know, silly, but this is what you need to do to be formally correct. In a US application, putting your picture in will get you sorted out. In a big company, no second question. Oh, there's a picture in there. We cannot accept this application. You will be out. So you need to check that. Okay. And here's the very, very difficult one where I thought long and wide about it. If I put that in or not, I think the most difficult part of the whole talk. Um, chat GPT is biased already and doesn't talk, doesn't give you that of culture. This is, you know, has a certain political leaning in, in my company or my company's company that I'm currently responsible for. We have daily rule it means no politics, no ego. And I works well. Even so, we're in Berlin. We have 20 nationalities that work all together. There's no bullying. The people like each other. And I believe the secret is that we never talk politics. We we have Russians and Ukrainians working in the same department and there are no animosities. If we would discuss politics, that would most likely look different. So I'm usually staying clear of this topic. However, if you write applications or if you're looking for a job, I think you should know that. You should have some awareness of it. In Berlin, we have companies that try to hire 50-50, male-female, um, and that with a base rate in engineering, with a base rate of 8%. You know that in for psychologists, it's the other way around. We have more female as male or, you know, anything in between. If you apply as a white male without any special background in this company, you will get way less money for your skill set than when you apply in a small company that doesn't have any, let's say, that, that hire by merit only. So it is a thing that I find makes a big difference. And I'm, we are running a company that hires solely merit-based, and we ended up with a wonderful team with, from, you know, all shades and everyone. But I do know that it is frustrating and it's a reality if you apply in without having an awareness for the politics of the company and big companies i can tell you have by now strong biases which means if you fit those biases you absolutely should consider that you will get more money there and if you don't fit the biases you will be penalized fairly strongly. So I think this is something you should put into consideration when you apply. And also, you know, if you apply in a company and they have a strong agenda on their website and you know the people that you're applying to have this as well, it's another feature or set that you can mention and it will make a difference. Yes, as much as I say I stay out of politics, I think it needs to be said because GPT doesn't set it that clearly. Then, um, I think we had this one. Yeah. And we have also, this is not that. So the first part, your social media. Yes. If you have a Twitter. Yeah. Hey, you, you, you had that point. Uh, think of your Twitter account. Some people tweet stuff that I find in, and with recent conflicts, be aware. Right? You are. You're scientists. You're smart people. You are aware. I do still think that some people are um, having their social medias. It's cool. LinkedIn is a professional platform. What you do on your Twitter, but still, if your Twitter is your name and you have a strong position, then make sure it matches wherever you want to go. But I, I let me do it the other way. There's a question that I'm asked later. What is the worst outcome 
of an interview process, of a job application process? What's the worst outcome? Uh, rejection is hurtful in the moment, but ending up in the wrong job, you come out of university, you're pristine, you have choices. <clears throat> you have choices, you're in a good spot. Um, if you end up in the wrong job, you're not advancing, you're not learning, you're in misery. You either suffer through two years of being in an unhappy place. Um, this is taxing on mental health, let alone it's a bad step in your career. You are coming from a good thing. Your first step is a big one. And ending up in a job where you don't like it, where you don't fit, where you are not awesome, where you don't translate all your awesome skills to something useful, the company loses money. You are losing time. You're not. So I really think that is, if you wanted to have any job, yeah, there are. You know, Germany, unemployment is so low. You will find any job. Finding a good job, I would definitely go with the mindset. It has to fit your career plan plans. And if you take the wrong turn, not good. And by the way, a good company will not hold it against you if you make this interview go two ways and ask them, hey, this is where I want to go. This is my plan. Does that fit? Well, if your plan is to found a competition company to them or something like that. So there are some plans that are, don't fit with the company. But other than that, it's, yeah, the biggest thing, you want to have a job that fits you. Don't work for a company you don't like. Don't work for a company where you don't subscribe to their policies, to their philo philosophy. I, I wouldn't, right? So, yeah, worst outcome is getting a job that is not a fit for you. Good. Anyways, so, and to link that back, if you're having an opinion that doesn't match with what the company is doing, then you don't want to work there anyways. And there are enough good companies out there. There's no reason to work for a bad company in 2023. We're at the moment not in a desperate market situation. Don't let people tell you. On the other hand, they tell that there's a shortage of employees. So, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, last thing, um, you will be looked up, so it does make sense to follow them, get their newsletter. You can cancel the newsletter if you don't get a job, but it makes sense to be on all their platforms. You want to be on all their platforms anyways, because if you get to an interview, uh, it makes all the difference if you are smart about what they're doing. Okay, next point that I had there, um, I find it surprising how lit, the, how few people actually are active in touch with the job they really like. Just writing two follow-up emails over the process makes you top 5%, and it appears that you're really interested. So with all the effort that I'm putting to make objective measures, in the end, if things are tight, then what an employer looks for and it's the hardest to measure is motivation. Is somebody really motivated to join me? Is there, are they really motivated for this job? Are they really, or do they really want to do that? And this is so hard to measure. Company that's in Berlin, we get a lot of application where I can tell they want to work in Berlin. They would work for this company, not because they like this company, but they want to have a job in Berlin. And then you have once in a while, you have people, we have three people from Brazil. Um, and they all were from within this industry. And I knew they really want to work for this company. They would work for this company, whether it's in Berlin, whether it's in New York, or whether they apply to the company. And this is the people that stay with you long term and are motivated. So if you can convey to the company that you're really interested in them, that is for them a big plus. And one way of doing that is going that little bit further and being in touch with them. If you if you are writing a, a job application and you have put in the effort to make it personal and fitting and you reached out to somebody of their team members on LinkedIn and connect with them and had to talk with them. So now you have two interaction points. You write this application and you follow up two weeks later and says, hey, wrote your application, just wanted to make sure that I get it because I'm really interested in the position. Okay. 
don't would write them five. But anyways, they say, oh yeah, thank you. We got your application. We will get back to you, whatever. Um, and as a good salesperson, I would say, write them with an open door. Don't close the door. Hey, I will follow up in two weeks if I don't hear anything. If you had an interview, you want to write them back the next day and say, I enjoyed the interview greatly. That was interesting, blah, blah, blah. Here I have an additional question or um, just saying thanks. And again, open door. How is the process progressing? I would always ask that so you know they either get back to you in a week or two or three weeks. So you could write them um, with an additional email. I know we will be soon with another phase. I I will be for a week on vacation, so in case you are planning, or I would be looking forward with this time window wouldn't work well for me, or I have something. So I'm sorry, I can make up excuses why I write somebody, but you're so mindful to write me that you are not there in the week so I can plan. So this is somebody who really thinks about it, who really wants to do that. This is things how you can be in touch. Or you know that whatever, this company does something, there's some event, there's some newsletter or some whatever that uh, you read and then in the next step, you talk about stuff that they have. Oh, I saw your newsletter, blah, blah, blah. Then you're not actively in touch by reaching out, but you're demonstrating that you um, are active in touch with the company by following their information or their media. I would nearly say again, ask GPT, how am I in touch with the company during the application process? It will come up with 20 more ideas. Yeah, there's one thing that I should, um, we talked about that you're interviewing the company. There's one thing that you underestimate. I find medical doctors, when they leave with their degree, they are, you know, the almighty, the doctor rest of mankind they come out there and think wow we learned something we're unique we're really good and they have learned something they're really good at it i find frequently that uh neuroscience psychologists and so on you underestimate how much you have learned and the skill set you have the skill sets of being able to objectively measure human behavior and predict human behavior and analyze big sets of data with while understanding that don't underestimate how awesome you are so i think maybe the last point settle with salaries spend some time to figure out what salaries are in the industry because yeah some companies have lower brackets but and and Maybe not a fact. So we have people from all over the world. And of course, a company would hire somebody from all over the world because it's cheaper. So yes, the uh, whole point of having, as I said, there is no shortage in labor if you would be willing to pay high prices, right? So whenever they say there's a labor shortage and we need to import people, that means we want to pay people less. Um, so you can look at that and can say, where am I? Where's my unique skill set? Which companies are um, paying for that? Then look how much those pay, how high those pays are. And if you have the flexibility and you go uh, to a job, banking insurance, or to a region where at the moment the people are looked for, you have to bring the mobility, then you can price that in. And just looking at the average job that is paid, this will make you ask, for too little so you know steps oh and know that platforms like stepstone and glassdoor versus gehaltscheck in germany give you different numbers stepstone is giving numbers that shall motivate you to change their job they make their money by people changing jobs and gehaltscheck is using average numbers so look at the two numbers and know where they're coming from and then price in all the other factors pricing that you're awesome and then you should have a good feel for the money that you are asking. And there's one more trade-off that I think to do. Being in a really awesome company that is the next step to your career, yeah, price that in as well versus I'm going to work for a bank. Nobody wants to work there or insurance company. I will be paid more. So you have to talk to people, have a good understanding because very little jobs come with, oh, we're paying exactly that.
this flexibility. Let's fundamentally agree that 95% of the year you can be aligned with your employer and you can have the same interests and you want to do good in the job and so on and so forth. Yes. And then in a small company, they are trying to pay as little as they can and you try to get as much as you can. And there is, you have a lot of companies that you can work for and they have a lot of people that can work for. Free market principle, right? So in this case, it's a gamble and it's unfortunately, even if you go in and say, hey, what's the bracket? They will give you a low ball pra- uh, bracket. And if this is already their type of approach, then, you know, it's not a good starting point, I find. I find if the company is trying to pay you as little as possible, then you work for them as long until you find something that pays you better. So it's kind of a bad approach, but it's, let's face it, is still a lot of the industry, the reality. I find bigger companies do that better. They have those fixed brackets and they can tell you, if you start working for us, you will get in this position this much to that much, and it's based on this three, four factors. If they come and tell you that, You can ask some other things like, hey, is there a relocation bonus or is there a training bonus or is there, you know, there's again, ChatGPT. There's a list of things that you can ask and pick three uh, that are important and valuable to you, kind of make it a win-win situation. So in big companies, you will get brackets and you know your room. In small companies, it's a little bit of a negotiation. But again, back to point one, if they're paying you too low, you don't want to work there anyways. So You know your price and you know what would make you happy. So you go in there and if they're not willing to pay, ask your price. If they're not willing to pay that, you may lose that job, but maybe you wanted to lose that job at that point. And I'm not the authority on that. This is a topic where I don't think I have a really good answer. But yeah, the best answer I can give is I think it depends. The bigger the company, higher likelihood they have brackets. You can ask for those brackets. There will be still no, nobody pays more for a car than you have to pay for the car. It's the same situation. Um, but a Tesla shop, you will have fixed prices. And at a tiny used car garage, it's negotiation. So jobs with a neuroscience background at Nyrex uh, of those 20 people. Um, we have two two ways how people develop. The one is the personality and and management pathway. And basically as an independent factor, we have the individual contributors or the skill set. A lot of people are in consulting, either in support um, or in, uh, let's call it sales, right? I'm selling a job there, right? So I'm doing it as well. We call it consultant, but it's no cold calling. It's going to conferences, talking to smart people. Um, so a lot of people start in, in support. And at one point, they figure out that the consultants that do the sales are actually traveling the world and going to all those conferences and talking to the smart people. And then they switch over. So that I think is a very typical career path. Um, we do have people that are... Uh, doing something like technical writing, grant writer. They uh, come with a science background. We have people programmer that started off from computational neuroscience and um, started as interns and are now going in the programmer route. Um, yeah, grant writing, I'm thinking. Oh, we have people in marketing that's doing, uh, reading the papers and basically uh summarizing them and putting our the, what our customers are doing together for the newsletters. So, but we are a small company, 50 people company. There are people, neuroscientists, you have a much wider range, particular if you translate your skills. So we don't do business development at the moment because we're too small, but that would be a position. Um, and then basically HR, neuroscience background, knowing how to measure people, you could absolutely fit into HR realm as well, or you know, there's I, I could see myself hiring an HR p- person with a neuroscience background. But let me let me show you one slide here. <laughs> oh. Okay, 
Perfect. Then thank you so much for having me. Um, if you want to, here, here, here we are. Connect on LinkedIn. Reach out if you have questions. Uh, was very yeah. nice talking to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.